Good afternoon and welcome to the Tuesday Times Roundtable, where each week we engage in conversation around current issues, trends, and problems that are of interest to you. I am Sherry Beeson, your host and Senior Program Coordinator for the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. With me is Anna Prado, also from the Office of Global Learning, and she'll be helping facilitate today's session, as well as monitoring the chat. Behind the scenes, but never far away, is Taylor Signs, our communications guru, who sends you announcements regarding all things global and your Global Learning Medallion newsletter, The Globe. If you're just now joining us, I'd like to remind you to keep your mic muted during the presentation. If you feel comfortable doing so, please turn your camera on. We love seeing your face, and especially if you have a question to ask, but we understand if you don't, and we are recording today's session. Feel free to post your questions in the chat. Again, Anna and I will be monitoring the chat function and we want to make sure all your questions get answered today. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Emmanuel Bowles, who will be talking with us about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Dr. Emmanuel Bowles has been a, resource, a human resources professional for over 13 years specializing in the areas of talent acquisition, talent management, diversity and inclusion, and human resource development. She is currently the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at our very own Florida International University. She also teaches managing diversity, human resources management, and recruitment and staffing at FIU as an adjunct professor with the College of Business. Dr. Bowles holds a bachelor's and a master's of business administration from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. She completed her doctor of education in organizational leadership with a concentration in human resources development at Nova Southeastern University. Dr. Bowles is actively involved in the FIU community she is a graduate of the FIU Presidential Leadership Program, a one-year professional development program designed for current FIU faculty and staff, focusing on challenges faced in and trends within higher education. She also served as a subcommittee member for FIU's Equity Action Initiative. Dr. Bowles has received the 2012 Presidential Excellence Award for her role in the Panthersoft Core Human Resources Team. She is a 2014 Blackboard Exemplary Course Award winner, and she received the 2019 Florida Tax Watch Productivity Award for her role in the Self-Service Solution Team. Dr. Bowles' current research areas include human resources management, organizational change, managing diversity, and change readiness. She holds memberships with the Society of Human Resources and the Greater Miami Society of Human Resource Management. She is also a wife, mother to a three-year-old toddler, and a lifelong learner. You guys, please help me welcome Dr. Bowles. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here today with you all. All right, I'm going to, oh, and there's the screen that told you guys everything I said. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can all kind of see each other and get involved in this conversation with Dr. Bulls today. Take it away. <laughs> so um, I'm here today to talk about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Um, I'm happy that you, I see a number of different faces here, um, and I, I understand you all are FI students, faculty, staff, or community partners, um, and I'm happy that you all are making your time over this lunch hour to have this important conversation with us. So, Sherry, uh, I'm open to questions, answering the questions, and then to get this conversation going, because I want it to be a two-way dialogue 
um, an opportunity for us to learn together today. Absolutely. So one of the things you mentioned when we were just chatting a moment ago was it's one thing to say we recognize George Floyd's murder and it's another thing to say we think that's important and it should change the way we do things in our own office communities. But then I think you were saying the focus of the article was actually on an entity that didn't go much further than that. They just kind of talked about it and didn't do much more. Is that the case? Yeah, and you know, so the article talked about um, the, it, it, that the organization actually had a diversity council which is up to be applauded, right? That the organization thought it was um, important enough to have a council that represents their entire um, employee population with different um, representation on the council to be talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in their own organization. And what can they be doing, what can they do together to move the needle to improve the, the, the how people feel within their, uh, people of color specifically feel within their organization which was a, this to be applauded, right? But then the council felt like there was, it was like a dispute, right? Between upper management, specifically the CEO and the council, because there was a number of different things. Like um, they didn't feel that the changes that they were recommending was happening or the life of their, their employees of color were, were any different. So it's more than just to say, I have a council or I have a chief diversity officer. Um, but are you listening to what they're bringing of, of concerns? What are you doing? And the CEO referenced that changes had been made, but does your council know that? Do your employees know the changes? Do they feel and see the changes? So it's more to just say, oh, we have a council, we have made changes. So, okay, great. What are those changes? Are there, is there a scorecard that, not that diversity is a check the box kind of thing, because I don't really like that, right? So diversity should be a part of an organization's DNA. Right, that it it's so ingrained in what you do. It's not it's not an afterthought. It's part of what you do. It's a thought in everything that you do in terms of how you look at who you're service servicing. Right? Does your employees reflect the population of customers, or for us at FIU, our student body, our community, do our our faculty and our staff a representation of that population? So. A number of things came out of that article that I was like, okay, bravo for the having the council, but are you working with your council and actually moving the needle and, and, and having your employees of color feel like they belong to the organization? Absolutely. So in our offices, we mentioned this as well before before you guys joined us, we are reading the book Race Talk. And one of our questions was, was how do we, all of us are either um, Hispanic or white, how do we, we have one South African, but he's white. Um, <laughs> how do we talk about this without more voices of color in on the conversation? And maybe, maybe you want to address that. Um, give us some guidance here. So yeah, the, um, I applaud, and I, you heard me say I applaud because you know that's important. So I applaud you all for reading the race talk book because that's important for raising your awareness and and getting perspectives that aren't represented on your team, right? And so not that you all don't have diversity, but the the different perspectives as a person of color from different, you know. Um, populations. And so um, there's other opportunities to have that voice, those voices be heard. Um, when we, we have a DEI council, we have a diversity, equity, inclusion council that we set this year um, at the university. And we decided as a council to read the book as well and have um, discussions around the book, right? So we can all hear from how what aha moments are we having? We had some guided questions to help us through the conversation, but we also brought in other people that weren't part of the council to share their expertise and their, their lived experiences and their, um, their resources to help us as we process through the book. 
So the opportunity to bring others, you know, if I use a great big place with many different <laughs> people on campus, then so maybe bring in someone as part that is a student, right? To get a student perspective because you service our students, right? Or a different faculty member from a different department that you work really closely with to get different lived experiences and, and to connect, right? So the very important and deep work that we need to do and what race talk talks about is increasing your awareness, one, being comfortable with having these uncomfortable conversations. Why is it uncomfortable? Because for many years, for many different reasons, right? Um, but people aren't used to having conversations. And Dr. Sue talks about that. You know, you're not used to having conversation about race. And sometimes when it comes up, well, as a person of color, I don't have a problem having that conversation. I black, I live in I live in the skin that I am, and I have had to have had to have that conversation many times. But even so, um, there's different conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion that I may not be privy to as because my social identity is different from others. And so connecting with others that don't look like me, that don't sound like don't that don't have the same lived experiences with me. Um, is an opportunity. And that's one of the things that we um, have recognized as a university is that we need to learn from each other, right? Building the connections and pulling in different opportunities for people to have conversations a lot about why diversity, equity, and inclusion is so important um, to any organization, to any um, actually person, right? It helps you as a person to, to learn, to um, increase your knowledge and understand other perspectives. And it helps you um, to understand, you know, the, the whatever role you, you serve in as whether it's a um, employee, faculty, staff, even as a student, to understand others' perspective helps you personally as well. Gotcha. All right, you guys, just so you know, this is an open conversation and please jump in, either raise your hand or unmute yourself or throw a question in our chat because we are monitoring the situation. Um, <laughs> Oh, I had see a hand. All right, DeAndrea, go ahead. Okay, I was ready. I was taking notes about All what right. I had to say. <laughs> um, on the com on the conver conversation of like diversity. So I'm pre med, and I feel like the biggest issue is when you're trying to talk about hey, like there is a race problem or a diversity problem, an equity problem. Um, I feel like in certain areas and and especially in medicine they're very quick to deny it. Like our role, we're here to help people. We don't discriminate, da, 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 da. But then there is. So how do you bring up that conversation, especially when other people of color um, um, deny it within the workplace as well? So like, I know that I was, I asked a male physician, a black male physician about, does he see um, that happen? Uh, microaggressions within medicine. And he was like, I don't see it. But then a black female physician was like, yes. So now I know I've been in positions where um, they'll pick the male side, not because he's a man, but just more because it, it coincides with their own beliefs than what the actual reality is. That's a great question, especially in the medical field. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm a very analytical person too. So I always say numbers don't lie. Right. And um, so when you talk about, especially because I'm going to your medical field, right? But this happens in another uh, a number of other different fields too, right? Um, STEM fields is what I, the STEM field um, is very uh, underrepresented in people of color, right? And so, but for the medical field, the data of the health disparities, right? That, that happens. Um, and, and it's kind of, people don't talk about it, right? But diversity, equity, inclusion also includes power and privilege, right? And so if you're in a position of power, sometimes you don't, maybe you don't experience it or for many other different reasons. I'm not going to go in too deep into that, right? <laughs> As a person of color to say that racism or systematic injustices do not exist, it's just inaccurate, right? And there's data to prove it. Right. So so if one person denies it, but I know my lived experiences, I know I have experienced it. And so and many others have, too. And the data is out there to prove and support it. So I'm not going to argue with you about whether it exists or not, because it does. Right. I mean, it does. <laughs> 
full stop, it does, right? Um, but I think what you're probably asking is you're trying to get expertise or guidance of how to navigate it in your profession, right? And so you're probably looking for a mentor, somebody to help you as a person of color in a field that's underrepresented and how do I navigate this space? So that person who told you it didn't exist may not be a good mentor for you. But the woman of color physician that said yes would probably help you navigate it more because she's more aware of it and more willing to speak to it, right? Um, I read um, How to Be an uh, Anti-Racist by Imbrum Ken Kendi. And that book had me, you know, saying ouch and saying hallelujah at the same time, because it um, also helped me become aware of the things that I, I do as a person of color that may be classified as not being an anti-racist, as being a racist in my own space, right? And so um, I say all of that to say, um, I think I'm answering your question, um, but it exists full stop. I don't need to ask you if it does or does it. I know it exists. How do I navigate it? I just need to connect with the people who are, are aware of it and can help me navigate it in my, because you're pre-med, in my pre-profession. So how do I, what do I need to do to get to where I need to be in connection with people who, who had lived experiences like you have are, are very important. All right. Does somebody else have a question? Uh, Anna. I don't have a raise the hand button. Sorry. So I'm physically raising my hand old school. <laughs> Dr. Bowles, first of all, thank you um, for sharing your insight with us because I think it's, it's really important. I'm thinking really of advice for students. So my question is, what advice would you share with young students getting ready to, ready to enter into these workplaces? What should they be looking for? in terms of an inclusive work environment? And how do you think that they can contribute to these inc inclusive cultures early on? Very good question. Um, as a student, you know, you're, in, you're learning, right? So um, be start becoming more aware of what diversity, equity, inclusion means from your own um, social identity, right? Um, and as you start to start thinking, cause you're here to get an education, to get a job at the end of the day right, <laughs> to get, or to go on to your next degree to get a better living for yourself, right? So as you start considering these organizations, start doing some research, right? Take a look at the website. Are, do you see people reflected in their, on their website? Do you see what they're doing in the space of diversity, equity, inclusion, especially since um, last year uh, after the George Floyd murder, a number of different organizations have either did a statement and did nothing about it or did a statement and are doing things to help improve the, their culture, their organization, they're offering their services for um, their, their, whoever they're serving. And so as a student, um, if you aren't aware of you know, racism because you come from a place where you have privilege, right? And you're learning about it, learn more. There's tons of books, um, webinars, free webinars, things that talks that FIU is having um, throughout the different campuses, not only from our diversity, um, equi equity and inclusion division, but across campuses that are talking about this a lot more. But, you know, start doing your research as a student, get a mentor, right? Get somebody you can, um, to help you navigate, to help you to, to help you realize things that you don't know, right? Um, I'm pretty sure there's different um, majors here, um, but you're, there's faculty members who are participating in all types of DEI initiatives across campus, externally research. Um, ask them of what things that you should be um, becoming more aware in the profession that you're going to. And then how can you contribute? If you're not a person of color, become an ally. What does that mean, right? Learn more about what being an ally means. Um, you know, there, there's there's something to be said about, um, you know, if I step in front of a group of people who don't look like me, it may be, you know, some of the, the, the stereotypes are, okay, here's another bitter person who, you know, is talking about something that doesn't exist, as opposed to hearing it for somebody who looks like me, right? Who's a peer to me and hearing why, 
well, what I thought, how you thought years ago, but then I started learning that, no, I, I do have privilege or I do have power and, and this is happening. Um, and I'm becoming more aware because it helps me to be a better colleague, a better leader if you're a manager, right? How do I manage a, a diverse team if you're not aware of the different issues that um, that are um, your employees are, are facing? So my, 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 my recommendation is learn, 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 connect, 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 <laughs> become more aware as much as possible, especially in the fields that you're going into, right? Um, D'Angelia talked about her pre-med field, right? Understand what is what is out there that you will face in the in the field that may not you may be the only one you may be the first, um, but that doesn't mean you'll be the last, right? And so there may be an opportunity for you to to get the name, gain the knowledge, and then help reach back and help somebody else who was in your shoe as a student when you become um, a professional in whatever career that you go into. Good deal. Jerisha has her hand up. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to know, um, as someone that is in the STEM field, um, I know we've been talking about like adversities and stuff in the field, but what can we do to set ourselves apart, to like make ourselves um, look like more of a candidate to, you know, overcome those obstacles of, you know, race and gender and stuff like that. How can we make ourselves a better candidate to where, you know, it would force or, you know, change someone else's mindset on, you know, hey, they may be of this particular race, but they have a lot to bring to the table. Maybe I should consider them for the job. Yeah, good question. Um, so I do want to say like you, like, the hardest thing to change is people's mindset, right? So Jeresha, I think I love your question because it's like, what can I do as a to, to stand out? And um, you know, I talked about mentorship, but there's also a, a mentorship is like a relationship that you cultivate and you build. But then there's also sponsorship and advocacy and connecting with people who will present you. Um, and this is what people call networking, right? old school way, words is networking, right? Um, networking with people in positions that if an opportunity comes up, uh, um, around, they can speak to you and they can advocate for you as a person. You know, I've been a recruiter for many years, right? And I'm not gonna say, <laughs> we as a recruiter in these organizations, we get a number of different applications um, and applicants coming through, but there's something to be said when somebody can advocate for you as a professional, right? So, you know, build your connections, get your experience, internships, um, so you can network and, 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 and become connected with people who can advocate for you as, while you're doing what you're doing. Make sure your resume <laughs> speaks to what you've done, right? Make sure you have somebody take a look at your resume that, you know, there's no, no typos, grammatical, you know, that you're presenting your best self forward um, and, you know, practicing interviews and stuff. But there's something to be said about not only having mentors, but people who can advocate for you when you are out there looking for a role or trying to be promoted because um, they could talk to your work ethic and talk about you as a person to help you, you know, kind of have a leg up. Not that I want to say that you have a leg up when you have that, I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, advocate for you when opportunities do come up about. I hope that answers your question, Jerisha. Yes, it did. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Bowles, I just want to interrupt for a second because I've, I've got a really great comment here in the chat from Deandrea, um, and it's a, it, it, she speaks to being an ally and ask, coming in and asking what a group needs instead of deciding what they need for them, and that's something that I know we've been talking about in our office. If you could speak a little bit more to that, because I, I think that that's, that's something that's powerful uh, for us to be able to learn how to do. Definitely. Even in my role here, right, um, and as we um, when we did the equity action initiative, and I applaud the president for calling, you know, not just putting out a statement about the George Floyd murder, he called for a group of professionals, three leaders to bring people together to actually look at our reality. How are our, you know, students of color feeling? What are they experiencing? What are our faculty of color feeling? What are they experiencing? Do we have enough, our staff, our, our community partners, our supplies, I mean, we went deep, right? Um, and so 
we we knew what we knew with our lived experiences, but I'm a fact, I'm a administrator, administrator, adjunct professor. I can't speak to your student experience. So what did we do? We went and we spoke to the students. And right now, to this day, we're still doing that. We're conducting these listening sessions to getting the perspectives to hear from those, right? To hear their lived experience, understand their challenges, hear it. I like the elders say, hearing it from, from the horse's mouth. Getting it from the actual people. You can't build a solution. I can't build a program. I can't build things to make things better unless I sit down and I hear and listen. Listen with my heart, right? Listen with my heart, not with my mouth and wanting to defend what we are doing, what we're not doing, right? Listen and be okay with being uncomfortable and hearing that things may not be working the way that we want it to, right? Or that we perceive it to be working. Okay, um, so it's so important to get the perspective. That's why it's so important to hear from each other, learn from each other, build those connections, because you may not be aware, but people experience it. And to hear others' experiences, then you'll be able to understand why diversity, equity, and inclusion is so important, period. Not only in the workplace, but in this world, period. Because diversity in numbers is not enough to just bring people in. Do they feel a sense of belonging? Do they feel like they belong in organization? Are they treated and given equitable opportunities for promotion, for pay? You know, are the pay practices, and this is not only for people of color, this is gender, right? I'm talking about gender, I'm stepping on the gender, pay, you know, equity and pay. Um, so, you know, that's why it's not just diversity, it's not just inclusion, it's also equity, right? That's where that E comes in. So. Um, it's so important to get the perspectives of others before you try to create a solution because you can't do that if you don't really know the actual experiences. We have a great question over here from Kamisha. She says, a lot of times when someone stands up for someone or someone else, yeah, the narrative changes to focus on the individual who is advocating instead of the problem they advocate for. How do you keep that focus on the issue? And so that's where the ally comes into play, right? So just becoming an ally doesn't mean that you're speaking for everybody, right? <laughs> you, you, you know, or, or, you know, it's easy to the, I call it, and many others call it the deflection, right? It's easy to deflect. It's easy to say, oh no, you know, start to not hear the problem you, or the, what we're addressing, right? You're hearing, okay, how can I deviate this conversation so we don't talk about the problem? So as an ally, if you're not that person, always bringing it back to what we're talking about, right? That's great that you don't think that this is this, but it does. So let's come back here and talk about this, right? Um, and be aware that that is going to happen. Deflection is going to happen. People are gonna feel, People have feelings, emotions get tied into. That's why talking about, about race turns, it sometimes is very heated, emotional, but that we always come back to the purpose of why we're having these conversations. It's because there's an issue, something needs to change and what can we do to change it, right? Let's not deflect, let's, let's redirect, let's come back. I hear you, let's work through your emotions, but we're, we're gonna work through your emotions in a space of this is what we're talking about and this is what we're trying to address. Thank you, Dr. So Jessica has her hand up. <laughs> Jessica, hang on. You're muted if you're trying to communicate with us. Yes, I was. Thank you, Ms. Beeson. You're welcome. How do I pull my hand down? <laughs> Don't worry about it. I think it disappears eventually. Oh, lower the hand. There we go. Hi, good morning. My name is Jessica Lasso. Thank you, Ms. Bowles, for sharing. I, I just want to have more like an, an opinion on it. Like when it, when it comes to the ally stuff, um, cause it sounds like it's being consolidated into like lobbying groups, right? But in terms of what um, one of my peers just said of how the allies start talking about themselves and in, in speech, I've been learning how, for example, Martin Luther King, right? When he spoke, he didn't speak of his problems, he was actually pretty well off for the for the, the where that the African American and Latino population was at at the time, where he was maybe a higher middle class talking for the people, 
and he used a lot of we and he used a lot of examples of other people that uh, that had been discriminated to win the hearts and minds of them right so in regards to the George Floyd thing I think that before we can make an opinion in South Florida right because we're in Florida International University um, we also need to understand the issue of the media and how sometimes the media portrays things and we do not really have a, a valid confirmation of what the issue is unless we're there. And so there was a lot of social, I've seen a lot of videos of things that were going on and I think it was what Minneapolis where the issue occurred. And I heard the, the chief of police give a statement on how there was these revolts going on and a white Caucasian man, right? Is, is talking about how there's a group of extremists, not just white people, it's a group of extremists who pretty much burned and inflamed the building and the protesters, right? The unpeaceful protesters were preventing the first responders from accessing the building and there was a child in there, right? So it's not just about race, it is about professionalism and education and understanding that when we're coming to a university, it's not just about getting a job, right? Because there's a difference between going to Florida International University and maybe a little private college that was, in, that was made in Hialeah that is charging $30,000 $30, a year for an associates and people go into, for example, a hospital. And we're in a cultural setting, right? Where professionalism doesn't mean just learning the basics and learning how to put an IV, but learning how you shouldn't call a person mamita or how, pardon my, my, my French, if you ha guys have ever heard the word N-I-G-G-A, right? which is, or acere, right? Which are things that start becoming cultural norms. And we need to make a bigger awareness on those things and how our vocabulary sometimes can be, how negative things can be more cancerous than positive. So if we can make that one little positive change, how we can overcome these adversity things if that makes any sense. Thank you. Well, Jessica, thank you for your opinion, you know, and so that's why we're having an open and frank conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I do wanna make a comment. George Floyd was not the first and only last person who's been killed, black, uh, a black person who's been killed by the police, right? This is deep. This goes back to when black people were brought over on slave ships to America, right? And so systems have been built in place um, when we were viewed as not even a person, we were viewed as property, right? And so if you talk about education, we have to go back educating about the history of racism and injustices in America. Somebody just said it's systematic. It is systematic wherever you are, whether you're in South Florida, you're in Minneapolis, New York, California, across the globe, right? And so racism exists full stop. We're talking about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace because it exists. I'm a Black woman. I identify as a Black Haitian American woman. I've experienced it. I've experienced it as a student in South Florida from you know when I was in elementary all the way up to when I went off to Tallahassee to get my education at Florida State, FAMU, and all that. Um, so I say all of that to say it's very important that we recognize people's lived experiences, right? And so it, it, we, it, it, I can't say it enough, full stop, it exists. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna argue with you about per perception of media um, because I don't need the media to tell me that racism exists, I've experienced it. And so have many other people that I am connected to. And not only as a woman, a black woman of, uh, of color, a Hispanic one, you know, Hispanic, colleagues and friends have experienced it. Maybe not in South Florida so much, but when you leave out of South Florida, it's a different experience, right? And so as a woman in pay, I look at my, my pay as a white woman versus a, a white male, my pay is 
difference. And I don't, I think it's like 88 cents to every dollar that a male makes. And so diversity is not just about one murder, right? That's what turned on the spotlight because of COVID, right? <laughs> At that moment in time last year. But this has been happening for many, many, many years. And so we have an opportunity to take the exposure and make some systematic changes. So I'm not here to change your opinion, Jessica. We all have it, right? I would- um, Well, Ms. Um, Bounds, I'm just, I'm just curious to know whether, uh, whether maybe it hasn't been something that has been systematically inc on the increase, rather more, it was actually beginning or on a, on a very well path to decreasing until maybe our, our, the previous administration that came into place maybe have, could have how, how his perception on the media would maybe, or the, the, the decisions that were made during his administration maybe caused a, a, a re-spike in that rather than it just being systematic. If there was anything that has been working or that did work in the beginning of the, of the 21st century and that we are now seeing it kind of like retrograde back to what it used to be. So we had an African-American president, right? <laughs> Before the last administration that we had and we still had disparities. We still had systematic racism and injustices in America. This is not something that goes away overnight, right? Um, and so I, I would, what I wanna say, and then we can move on because there's other hands. What I wanna say to you, Jessica, is I would recommend that you, you start uh, attending more conversations like this and speaking to your colleagues, your, your peers, and your, student, your friends, and asking some of the same questions that you're asking and, and getting you know, more awareness on the topic, right? Getting more history on the topic. Um, because it's been many, many years, and I can probably give you data of the in, inequities in pay and, you know, in, in, in being separate but unequal and how things are, the perception may be one thing, but data will show you that it really hasn't, spike whatever administration, no administration. But it's not until people actually sit down and, and become aware, right, and say this is an issue and we're going to be intentional about fixing these issues, will it get better? This is a deep, 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 deep work. <laughs> it's not easy, it's not gonna change overnight. It took many centuries to get here. Um, we just need more people to say enough is enough and we're going to make it our life's work like I have to make a change um, to the system. So thank you for your, your thoughts, Jessica. This is a great opportunity for us to all talk and hear and, 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 and become aware together. Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Bowles. We have a bunch of comments in the chat that basically reiterate what you're saying, that this has been going on. Maybe it didn't have the media attention that you know it's gotten recently, but it certainly has been going on. Um, I'm looking to see if there are questions, but I just want to read some of these comments just to make sure you guys um, guys see them because um, I'm sitting here. So Haley says, Trayvon Martin was killed during Obama's administration. Black Lives Matter was formed in 2013 during Obama Obama's administration. So just another example of, you know, this has been going on. Um, Sharima, Sharima? says just because it was not always shown in the media doesn't mean it hasn't always been happening. And Charlton says, hey, we should all read this book, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. So there you go. I bet we have another question from someone in the audience. I'm looking across to see if someone's hand is up at the moment. I know if not, I have a question in the chat that I'm gonna go see back the, to. And, the Andrea's hand is back up. Oh, cool. All right. Go, Deandrea. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm just going to say my two comments and then I'm going to say my question. Um, in regards to the, I, I typed it in the chat, but it's, I feel like with the last president, it just gave people confidence to speak about their beliefs, you know, their racist beliefs and everything. Um, so they were there. It's still here. It's been here for a long time. 
but under this president, you've just seen more action and more people being vocal about it. And I think that's really what this last presidency did more than anything, instead of just being private and just hating from silence and the actions that they did, now it's more media coverage on it. Um, and then my second thing that I want to say, when you were talking about education, Jessica, when you were talking about education of the community, I feel like the biggest problem is that we're college educated. A lot of the people we talk to are college educated, but just because you're college educated doesn't mean you're educated on the problem. And that's why I'm very adamant on going to the group of people and asking what the problem is or what they need, because I can't project what I feel the Latino or the Asian community needs the same way they can't project on what the black people, black community needs. Um, so like education is just past what's in the school books because remember the winners write what's in history, you know, and not the losers. Um, so actually like volunteer, that's why I feel like FIU is such a great school where they are adamant about volunteering in these communities. Like what do you, what is the problem and seeing for yourself and feeling it because the, the, the disconnect is that lack of empathy. I see you're complaining about something, but in my head you're complaining and I, I don't understand from your perspective. So that's where that empathy and educating yourself by being there and actually talking to the group of people. And so my um, question is, I feel like I can't speak for everyone and I've had this discussion with some peers, but there's a distrust between communities. And so, um, and that distrust can also affect allyship. So um, I, again, I can't speak for my entire community or other communities, but say um, I, I'm not quick to join and help and speak on your behalf because historically I've assisted in your, in your, in, your progress for your community, but then when it came to my community, there wasn't that same. Like once you got ahead, you didn't look back to help us. So you were able to get your rights, but then stopped. And like, again, like maybe with men, if you see it like this, men were, got the right to vote, but were they really fighting with us? Well, women needed their right to vote. It was like, we helped you, but why aren't you helping us in that mindset? So how can we like either overcome that mindset or actually bring conversation to this, this distrust that we're just not speaking about. Great point. Um, it's so important that you, you bring up the mistrust, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, what we're doing in this work is trying to, and we, we are, and you'll be seeing more opportunities to talk to each other, to learn from each other, to, to be aware that it is mistrust, right? Some people aren't uh, not, aren't brave enough to say that there is mistrust, may it be in the African-American community or the Black community um, to each other because there's a power balance too, right? That you spoke about, I'm educated, and but am I reaching back? Or I'm educated and I'm no longer low income or I was never low income, I was mid-class and so I don't have the, op the perspective of if I've never been a lower, low income earning. So there's a lot of opportunities to learn from each other across not only black and white, Hispanic, you know, the, the ethnicities, gender, but socioeconomic or LGBTQ and I'm and, and I'm heterosexual. There's opportunities to learn from each other and um you know giving the opportunity to connect, right? So um DeAndrea talked about, you know, are you hearing, right? Are you really hearing? Are you just hearing to like argue back and say you're wrong, right? <laughs> but actually listening with empathy, empathy, and I say listen with your heart, right? Don't listen to like say why you're wrong, listen to actually understand. Um, uh, um, Stephen Covey says it, I think it's principle number seven, if I'm wrong. Listen first to understand, seek first to understand then to be understood, right? And so understanding first before you can insert and be understood. So, you know, how do we do this? D'Angia, right, just what we're doing right now, having these conversations, we're raising everyone's awareness, having opportunity to connect and learn more, educating ourselves, connecting with a community that you're not comfortable with or you don't know more, right? You know, there's an um, a activity of, that I do is like you, you do a circle, your circle, your family, where you go and worship if you're a worshiper or where you grocery shop, where you live. And if you pick colors and you give each ethnicity the color, right? And if you put them in the circle of the people that you, you your family, who where you worship, 
is is it all the same? If I pick green for all of my black family, would it all be? I I have my entire family is black, and I worship in a black um, church, and where I work is predominantly black. Is it giving me an opportunity to learn from my Latino um, friends and 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 peers? Right. So identify opportunities to connect with a community that you're not familiar with, so you can learn more about. Um, and then allow people to celebrate who they are as a group, right? Um, allow people to celebrate and 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 be who they are and experience what they experience because they experience it and allow them to speak to what they're experiencing. And it's okay. It's okay for me to come with a peer, my 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 you know my black friends and be able to be safe enough to talk and vent and work things through. And that's okay to do as well. But also try to connect and learn a different um, group or social identity that you don't you don't identify with. So thank you, Gandhi. Absolutely. So we have a question from Lexis and then we'll go to our chat where we have a question and a comment. Go Lexis. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to piggyback off of what she said because when she mentioned, oh, you know, we have to put ourselves in different positions and be with other people. And so that way we could understand from each other and grow. I feel like that's a double-edged sword because I myself, I'm half black. My mom's white, my dad's black. They're both from the island of Cuba. So I grew up with this understanding that I am not full of each of, of either one. So I had to learn and embrace both sides of who I am and also the culture and the heritage that I was brought up with and still being told you're American USA, USA. But with that said, I remember specifically in my early years, early, early, early years of this social divide within the communities that surrounded me. So I remember that I wasn't black enough for the black community or white enough for the white community, but I specifically felt more hate from my black side. And I couldn't understand why the community, especially now that I've gotten older, and obviously I've made my peace with a lot of things, but I couldn't understand why that side shunned me so much. Oh, girl, you Cuban, you ain't black, or girl, please, you're not black enough because you're too white or your mama's white. Like I couldn't understand what they were going through, but I was still going through the hate. I was still not accepted within the community. So when it comes to putting yourself out there and trying to connect with your people, people that you are um, culturally from, because I have a very strong connection to my black side, to my African heritage. I know that my people come from a Yoruba tribe. I know I am grounded in my heritage. So when I was shunned as a child and even growing up, even up to middle school, I couldn't understand why I was so pushed out. And now as an adult and you know, in universities, you get to meet more intellectual people, people who are more open-minded. Then I still feel like we're still stuck between a rock and a hard place, specifically mixed race kids, because we're not accepted. So then we're told, oh, you don't know because you're, you have privilege or because you are half white or because of this and this. And there's a lot of finger pointing going on, but then you, there's certain groups, obviously it's not everybody. It's a group of people that ruin it for everybody else. Still point the finger, go, no, you don't know. But it's like, dude, I go through the same thing. I was called, I was called the N-I-G-G-A word as a child. And my mom had to tell me, you never repeat that. And you are not that, you are not ignorant. I was called a cracker, same thing. And I was called a spit a bunch of times from the black community, from the white community, but I did get a lot of heat from the black community. And it's still at that point did not make me want to be less black or half black, whatever anybody wants to like uh, uh, label me as. I was still proud to be what I was because that's who I am. But when she mentioned the, the exposure and to be amongst other groups and so you could understand what other people go through, I think specifically mixed race kids like myself, we have a really big understanding because we literally come from two or three or four different worlds and we can see it from each perspective, but it's hard when the other side is not accepting of you. It's just hard. It's hard to break that barrier. How can we progress when there's youth still in the community that is not taught? Hey, listen, you know, we're trying to make this progress and this change, but it has to start with the youth because I was, I was bullied by other little kids because I wasn't black enough and that, and that hurt. So it's like, 
and it's it, it's it's just it's unfathomable because you you expect things to change, but change things have to change from within before things can get better in the future. And that's just that that's what I just wanted to take it back off of. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you for sharing your perspective because it's it I keep saying this is deep work. <laughs> deep work, right? And so it's not all right, I'm gonna go a little deep too. So I'm not mixed race, and so I don't share your experiences and it's valid, but I do have nieces and nephews that are of mixed race and and go through this kind of identity issue because they experience different types of um, hate from both sides, right? And so where do you connect and where do you um, move from there? And so I agree, it does start. Hate is taught. Hate is taught. Hate is, you're not born to hate others. Hate is taught. And then just so we have these conversations and we, you know, one of the things that we identify and this talk is great too, because as I'm hearing you all and your experiences giving us opportunities of what to think about to having different opportunities of conversations that you don't have to put yourself in. Thank you, Lexis, for kind of kind of correcting me on that, because I don't want you to go like if you're not from the hood to just go into the hood right on without somebody right <laughs> that is not what the connection you got to start kind of slow like meet a friend right find a peer that you're, you're comfortable with and you try to get to, there's different opportunities so attend a talk that's virtual so you can gain more knowledge so thank you for correcting me on that because i just want to put some ground rules about connection or out there um but lexi you're, you're right it, and and deandre has talked about the mistrust in communities I'm from Miami, right? I'm I'm Haitian American, right? And so I have lived experiences as a Haitian in Miami, um, and 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 being told some of the same things that you were told, Lexi, right? Because of the way that I speak, and why are you sounding like the white girl, you know, or you know, some of the so we all have different lived experience, and this work is deep. It's deep, um, but it starts with us. It starts with us, and how do we? Um, in whatever profession you're going into. If you are going into education, know that in the work that you do, if you're working with our, 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 our young kids in the schools, right? The his, somebody think you yeah, Andrea talked about the history books were, were, does not include a lot of the black history or history period. Um, and so how does, you know, one not teach your kids not to hate? Um, the, there's a study by Jane Eyre, the blue eyed brown eye study um, that was done in the 60s and about, you know, privilege and power and, and, and things of that nature. And so I don't profess to have all of the answers. <laughs> I can just tell you that opportunities for us to have these conversations and hear from each other. So hopefully we take away from some of the, this conversation that we've been having and the experiences that everybody has been sharing and take something away from that to make you more curious to learn more. So what can I do in my space, in my social identity, in my school, in my profession? What can I do to improve what we're talking about here today? The rest of the equity and inclusion for all. And, and, and the, the, the playing field is not even, right? There, there's barriers, there's equity barriers. Um, people have different experiences that, that, that doesn't lend them to be successful as others because of the opportunities that they've been given in life. And so um, that's where I wanted to say, but Lexi, you make a great point. So thank you. We might have time for one more question and it's over here in the chat, but I hope all of you are checking your chat because we've had some great comments over there. Um, and yes, Lexis, thank you for sharing. And, and I, I think we hear your pain for sure. And, and we want it to be otherwise. That's why we're here. <laughs> yes, it's awesome. Um, and, and, and I appreciate this, you, this openness and, you know, that people are having in this conversation. Um, it's great. And, and Charlton put something about divide and conquer as opposed to unity. You know, it is, it is something that keeps us separated. And so the, the opportunity to come together and hear from each other is a start. Is not the answer, right? It's not the only thing that's going to. If that was the, the case, you know, it would we would have been free with Martin Luther King's speech, right? Uh, you know, the I have a dream speech. Um, so um, this is a great start. So thank you all. For so Dr. So Bowles, Kamisha asks in 
in workplaces, how would you combat minority merits being reduced to just filling the racial quota? I've heard talks where people would just say, someone was hired by a company or admitted to a university to fill the racial quota and not hired because of their own hard work and talent. So I wanna say this, quotas are illegal. Constitutionally, it's been voted through, uh, uh, you know, I, opinions and, 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 and considered by the Supreme Court. Qu quotas are illegal. What, you, what organizations can do is be more intentional and in looking at their numbers and seeing where is there not representation within my own workforce and make goals to strive to diversifying your, may it be that, is it race or gender, right? And so quotas are illegal. I, I wanna say that. And checking off the box of bringing people in just to bring people in is, does not solve an issue either. Right. It's about when I do cast my net, am I casting my net to a diverse group of individuals who would have the same opportunity to see the role that I'm hiring for and would apply? And when they apply, they're giving the same, you know, fair process in the interviewing and being selected. Right. So it goes deep. Right. So then even with casting the net, are the people who are interviewing them aware of their unconscious biases that they have that plays into selecting people during the interview process, right? So as an organization, you have the responsibility to make sure that you're being proactive in identifying and ensuring that you're having a fair and equitable process with your employment practices. I had to get legalese there on you all because I'm also the equity officer for the university. I oversee the affirmative action plan. Because it's not just enough to say, I'm checking off a box. That's not diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's I'm bringing people in, they feel that they are valued and they can belong and, 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 and contribute to an organization. Because def diversity, equity, and inclusion impacts performance, it impacts innovation, it impacts the bottom line, right? Organizations that are more diverse bring in more revenue. You know, this is not me just spouting this out. This is research documented. You can go read on that. It's it's out there, and it 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 it's that's why we're having these conversations. Why it's so important, right? And so, um, I, I I went off my tangent about quotas because whenever somebody says quotas, I'm gonna tell you it's illegal, right? I'm gonna tell you organizations can't have quotas because that's a first surefire way of getting a lawsuit, right? But it's what you do to ensure you're being intentional and ensuring a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce. This has been such a great conversation. I can't believe we're already out of time. Um, for those of you with questions about um, Global Learning Medallion Points, stick around. But first, let's all please thank Dr. Bowles for being here to open this conversation. And it's not over. We're going to come back. I'm going to try and get you to come back next year so we can do some more talking. <laughs> thank you for having me. And I thank you for everybody for being so engaged and um, you know, having a, um, a, a, a great and open conversation. Continue to have these conversations. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to Global Learning for having me. Um, for Our pleasure. Time.